So I have my hesitations around people scamming people and pretending they're smarter than they are, that their gurus and gonna help you. But something about Sadhguru's work does speak to me. I think he has a lot of really good qualities to his work and I have yet to read his books, though I had them all purchased before I came to Europe. I had to give them away because I couldn't fit them in my luggage. So I have to rebuy all his books because I'm really interested in them. I've been watching his YouTube channel mostly in his lectures. I haven't watched everything he's put out, okay? I'm not like a chronic watcher of his. I've seen maybe 20 or so videos, um, very short videos anywhere from literally like 10 minutes to 40 minutes. So they're not very long. Um, but I've done enough watching and I've basically always liked his perspective. Now, he feels very five to me on my levels of introspection, but because he comes from a very specific bubble and he preaches his work through that bubble, I just don't have any idea. I don't have any idea what he truly like thinks about the world from his own perspective. He's worth like $25 million. He's known for being the guru who rides motorcycles. That's like his thing. Okay, that's like his money spending habits. I've looked up his name in terms of controversies and nothing really comes up. There's some people saying that he's like a con man in some ways, but it's difficult because I don't know what that means, right? If I don't, there's not a lot to back that up. Um, I'm not sure what he's going to say in this particular podcast. It's called Saguru Prediction. Why are we are now on the brink of extinction in quotation marks. But he's been doing this campaign recently about the soil. He went on Joe Rogan to talk about how we have to be better to the earth, basically. He hasn't said anything that I haven't heard before. He just says it in a way that's really digestible. He reminds me a little bit of like what I think uh, Eckhart Tolle does, but in a different way. So again, I'm not like saying, oh, you guys should listen to him. He's the best. I'm just saying he's a guy that I find on YouTube. I like his videos well enough. I don't know his internal perspective. I don't know what his true intentions are, but he seems to give like relatively good advice. And I've never seen him in a podcast format like this. The one with Joe Rogan, I can't, I couldn't, I didn't watch it. So like I got like, I get the four hour formats, like I wasn't in the place to watch it. But with this one, it's an hour and maybe it will be interesting. I don't know. So we'll have to see together. So let me turn off the music from Elvin, the music linked. And now, uh, yeah, let's see what we can learn. If it's not interesting, we'll switch to something else. But I think this might be right up our alley. So let's see. The World Health Organization made a prediction. There will be a mental health pandemic. But this is not something that has to happen. If you want to fix this, you need to. Sad guru. One of the most viewed gurus in the world. His mission is to raise every human being to the peak of their potential, who has built one of the largest nonprofit organizations in the world. We have more than any other generation ever had in terms of comforts and technologies. Yet, we are miserable people. You want to be something more all the time. That's why you suffer. Just tell me, is there one thing that human beings are not suffering? Somebody is poor, they suffer their poverty. Somebody becomes rich, they suffer the taxes. If they're not married, they suffer, get married. I don't have to say anything <laughs> You're making up a purpose to bring some meaning to your life. But if you try to enhance your activity without enhancing yourself, you'll only die of stress. What about trauma? You're finding an excuse for the way you are, which you yourself don't like. If something unpleasant happened to you, you have two choices. Either you can become wise or you can become wounded. Your experience of life is determined by you. If your happiness depends on what happens on the outside, you being happy is a remote possibility. <laughs> I want to be happy. What's step one? There is a simple practice which we only take 21 minutes and this is when human beings can do something absolutely fantastic. First thing is... I just want to start this episode with a message of thanks. A thank you to everybody that changed the course of everything on every week. This is a You're on. What is the the mission that you're on? Well, today, you know, a few months ago, the WHO or the World Health Organization made a prediction that there is going to be a mental health pandemic. At least five years ago, none of us knew what is a pandemic. Today, we all know what is a pandemic. And they've gone further and they said the next stage is 
there will be a suicide pandemic, just to put it in perspective. In 2020, when the pandemic was in full swing all over the world. Mm. Should I get my notebook out? I've got my notebook out. Um, What's the interviewer's channel? I like him. This is Diary of a CEO. I'm going to link it in the chat, bro. Here, I just linked it. You guys can watch it. Let's take notes if you guys want. I already like, I already have so much to say about this idea. The World Health Organization is warning people of mass mental health crisis. Already, <clears throat> I could like talk for two hours on this already, right? What does that mean? What is everyone's solution going to be? Everyone's solution is going to be whatever worked for them in their bubble. Meditation, religion. Oh, you just need to be more like me. Like the truth is, is that this crisis of mental health is just this generation, this history's pinpoint of their, their tragedy, right? This is just our struggle. So <clears throat> if you're, if you think like I do, and I think about my work and I think about how I would calm someone down, it's more like, hey, you're just existing in like a blip of history. And this blip of history, our crisis is not the Black Plague, it's mental health. And mental health is a complicated problem that is not going to be generalized as a solution. It can't be because mental health is individual. So if you try to generalize mental health, you're going to mess it up just like you always have, right? Because you're going to think all BPD girls are the same. All BPD boys are the same. You're going to think, oh, all MPD boys and girls are the same. All non-binary people are experiencing mental health because they're non-binary. Oh, trans, that's a mental health. You're going to think, you're going to generalize and you're going to, you're going to make the mistake I think everyone's always made about mental health and they probably will and it is going to be what it is, right? So for me, when I think about why there's probably going to be a mental health crisis, it's like, well, privilege, because now we have time to to know we've been traumatized because it does take a certain level of privilege to even have the time to think about your mental health. And then another part of that is like a lack of privilege to fix that. It's like being right in the middle. I know a lot of people who really struggle. They have neurodivergency that's like pretty extreme, but they're just introspective enough and like able enough to know that they're limited. It's a really hard place to be in. Have you guys ever been in that place where you're literally stuck and you can't get out, but you also know that you're stuck and you can't get out? It's really scary versus being in a place where you're like, I'm I'm stuck and I can't get out. So like whatever. Or like I'm stuck and I could get out, but I like you don't know any better. Like the, do you know what I'm saying? The difference between like I don't know any better, you know? So I know people, like I know a few people I'm thinking of who like have autism and their autism is just <clears throat> extreme enough that they're going to need um, a higher level of care and support, but they also know that, but they also can't get out of that. Like I can't tell if like when they get stunted introspectively, if it's because of their autism or because of their personality, like I can't tell. And it's a struggle because they'll say the right things, but they get stuck and they can't get out. Or I know somebody who is like, they'll say the right thing to me. And I'm like, yeah. And then they can't implement it. And I'm like, what's happening? And there's like a, a misconnect, like a misfiring where they can identify the problem, but they can't do anything to fix the problem. And I'm like, okay, but there is something to do. But what is the thing for you? If you try to generalize those people, you're, you're going to have a suicide anyways, because those people need individual care right? And we need to acknowledge that a part of our population won't survive, period. No matter what we do, they won't survive the war. They won't survive the mental health crisis. They won't survive the homelessness crisis. There is always going to be a part of the population that is not going to survive, whether that's natural selection or a tragedy because society didn't do enough, right? In Japan, more people died of suicide than of the pandemic. True. So we don't really need the virus, that's all I'm saying. Because the virus has gotten into our head. Because once survival is taken care of, you t if you did do not become conscious, the way you sit, stand, breathe, think, emote, and function within yourself, if it does not become conscious, you will naturally head downhill. This is uh, just September 23rd, I completed 40 years of this work. So forty years ago, I was a young man. One afternoon, 
when I had nothing much to do, somehow an hour and a half gap was there for me. In the work, I was working like morning, 5.30 in the morning to 11 in the night, building various kinds of businesses around me. So when I got a break, there's a small hill. This hill is a place where we go and uh, for the youth. When I was a kid, I cycled up this hill, we camped on this hill, we partied on this hill. If you want to test our motorcycles, we went up the hill. Mm. Just about anything you want to do, the youth, go to Chamundi Hill. This is the thing. I just walked up and sat on a rock. My eyes were still open. I thought it's just ten, fifteen or twenty minutes. Suddenly I started feeling every cell in my body literally dripping ecstasy. I thought this lasted fifteen, twenty minutes, but when I came back to my normal senses, four and a half hours had passed. For the first time in my adult life, tears, me and tears were simply impossible. Tears to a point, my shirt is all wet. Then I shake my skeptical mind and ask, what the hell is happening to me? All I knew was, I had hit a gold mine and there was no context. Nobody around me could tell me what was happening with me, nor did I know what was happening with me. This is something that most people will experience in their lives. On a certain day when they are very happy, twenty-four hours feels like ten minutes. Another mm. day when you're depressed, ten minutes will feel like twenty-four hours. <laughs> mm. That's funny because I was watching A Hundred Humans on Netflix and they tried to do this experiment on the people that were in the boring room actually thought time went slower and the people who were in the party thought it went, no, went slower and the people who were in the boring room thought it went faster, which contradicted this. But generally speaking, humans are having an experience where when you're happy and excited, life goes by quickly. And when you're depressed and anxious, it lasts forever. When you're like in pain, it lasts forever. I actually think that this is different with different bubbles. But I think this idea is interesting, right? Because like, it's not always the case, but it, it's, a, it's an interesting generalization. <laughs> <laughs> time is a very relative experience. I when mean, you're what is time, right? So blissed out. What is two minutes? It's eight hours, ten hours. Just gone like that. So in about six to eight weeks, I came to some kind of stabilization within myself and started experimenting as to what is happening to me. Mm. Then I realized, if I keep a little distance from my physiological and psychological activity that's going on, if I just remove myself a little bit, then within, within a few seconds or within a couple of minutes, every cell in my body is bursting with ecstasy. Hmm. Now, this is not just my experience. Today, we have it measured out in Harvard Medical School, how there is uh, endocannabinoids are bursting out in people simply because they do a simple practice. So I made a plan in two and a half. Um, Nero says, is it normal to experience that amount of happiness? I think I've never felt that happy just randomly or at all. Um, I experience it, but it's not randomly truly. It just appears randomly. So like I'll experience like intense like happiness and specifically happiness, right? If I, 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 Joy to me is like this fundamental feeling of radical acceptance that you have throughout your life, no matter what is happening externally. Happiness is a relationship you're having with like a moment in time and usually related to external or internal, but it's like, it's an emotion. And sometimes I get like these intense moments of happiness, specifically happiness around my partner. And it will look like it's coming out of nowhere and it's so random and I'll just be like, oh my God. And I like my nephew gets it too. And my ne it's like the way we express it, but it's like all we're doing, I think it's something is leading up to it. Like you're eating an amazing piece of candy or I'm looking at my partner and realizing like, oh my gosh, like I'm having another realization of like, I found my person and like, it's so exciting. And I'm like, oh my God, I like, this is so cool. And there's something really magical and powerful about it. And so you're like, oh my God. And you're just like so excited. But like also your body's having all of, before that even happens, there's so much already moving into it. A thought occurred and the thought translated like it it went throughout my whole body and then my body built up all this adrenaline and all of a sudden I'm having this like feeling of great happiness it looks random but in a split second like so many things are happening so that's what I feel like you can experience like these like moments of like happiness 
I want to experience that too. Did you experience that as well in your 20s? Mm, great question. Moments of my life, I would experience it. And if it was just as authentic, but I would say that it's even more powerful of a feeling now. You know what I mean? I, I, I remember experiencing it rarely, but on occasion in my 20s, rarely though. And it was important and it was the same feeling, but the way that I feel it now feels so much more. Yeah, when you're so happy you cry, that feeling. When you're so happy you cry, that happens a lot to me. I've been doing that a lot lately where I'm like so happy and like I can't help, like I don't know how to express it except I end up crying. It's like a joyful cry. It's like such a happy cry. And um, my partner receives it very well, but it's just being grateful. It's like you're in that moment, you're like so alive and you're so grateful to be where you're at. So I would say that in my 20s, it's like I felt a shadow of that because I had like a moment of happiness. But the way I feel it now is like profoundly different. I'm really weeping with joy, which is like an amazing experience to have. I'm, You know what I mean? Now for your time, I will make the whole world blissed out. I knew the methodology. If you just keep a distance, it'll happen. For years now. <laughs> <laughs> Today, people are saying we are touching over two billion people. Last year, our video views have been 3.51 billion. So, people think that's great. But no, that is less than half the population as far as I'm concerned, because I started thinking I'll make the whole world blissed out. But people are committed to their miseries either because of their beliefs or their ideologies or their compulsive behavior within themselves. Okay, right there. I do agree. I think your beliefs, your ideologies are killing you. I think your belief is destroying your life. Your relationship with what you believe and what you think you know is absolutely destroying your life, right? And... The third thing is that the phys physiological or psychological relationship you're having or the trauma you've endured, that is destroying your life, right? So it's not to say that everything you do is you, but everything you do is you. Those life, like tiny little contradictions, everything you do is you. And it doesn't matter if it comes outside of you or not. Every relationship you're having with existence has to do with you. Like when I can't problem solve existence, when I'm looking at someone and I'm frustrated with them, I'm frustrated with myself for not solving the mystery, right? When we're in life and we're sitting here like I'm being abused right now, I can and should be frustrated with the person who's abusing me, but I'm mostly frustrated with myself for not getting out of that situation because everything we're doing is us. We are powerful and independent except in the moments that we aren't. And so I think the way we believe about ourselves, like I can't get out of this situation, I have to stay here, I have to fix this marriage, as you're literally being beaten, is killing you. Your belief around your need to stay in an abusive marriage is killing you. Your need to say, I have to cheat on them, it's the only way to do it, it's the only way to do it, that's killing you. You're not being dignified in the relationship you're having with yourself. The way you're raised, the thought you, your parents give you or your teachers give you or the neuroses the world gives you is your belief that they're right. So you torture yourself because of that relationship you're having with that belief, right? It's kind of ironic. It's like, yeah, the world, like I don't want to be in this situation. This environment's really toxic for me. It's toxic because if I stay here long enough, I'm going to start having to pick sides and I'm going to start drowning in this belief and I'm going to start having to decide who's a bad guy when like none of us should be the bad guy we should all just stop doing this but we can't right so it needs to happen to the whole world this is I don't see this as a mission I just see this as an expression of my humanity suppose you hear a good joke will you tell somebody who's dear to you or will you cover yourself with a blanket and tell yourself of course I'd tell everybody yeah Pretend it was mine. That's all I'm trying to do. No mission. When My you... experience, I'm trying to just rub it off on people. Some stats for you that support what you said earlier. Someone dies by suicide in the UK every 90 minutes. 76% of them are male. The single biggest cause of death 
a man under the age of 45 here in the UK is by suicide. You said you spent a lot, a lot of time around business in the UK is by suicide. You said men under the age of 45 here are male. The single biggest cause of death for men under the age of 45 here in the UK is by suicide. Whoa. What? Did you hear that? You said you under the age of 45 here in the UK is by suicide. That's insane. Whoa. You said you spent a lot, a lot of time around business people and they appear to be the most unhappy and least mm -hmm. blissful no, people. No, I wouldn't say unhappy, stressed out. Stressed out. What is it that we're doing to them? Because I, I see myself, that I must be in that category to some regard because I've focused most of my time on, you know, building businesses and, you know, I guess to some extent material things. Mm. It's scary. Cass says it's scary how strong those beliefs can be and how hard it is to escape the stronghold it has on you. Listen, so last night I'm going down a rabbit hole. I fucking hate the internet sometimes. I'm going down the rabbit hole of TikTok. Don't trust things you see on social media. A lot of it is lies. A lot of it is fake. So I find this video and it's a horrible video. <clears throat> okay. And of course it's about the stuff that's happening over yonder and I'm watching it and I'm like, I have feelings coming up and thoughts like horrible thoughts about like, oh my gosh. And then I'm like, wait, this video feels suspicious. So I'm like, you know what? No, I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole. I'm going to watch something else. And I'm scrolling and I hear the same sound of humans being tortured that I heard in the previous video on another video. And I go, oh, wait. And I go to another sound. And I'm like, oh, and I see it on another video. And now my feed is showing me this sound. Not the same image, but the sound. And I'm like, where is the sound coming from? And I'm realizing like this video, these videos that people are taking the sound of being like, this is actually what's happening in this story is so bad and so twisted. And it's making you hate one group of per people over another group of people. And I'm like, look at the way even me, who I think I'm so self-aware, my brain falls for it. My brain, my body, every part of me starts to panic. And I start to think like, oh my gosh. And then I'm like, wait, no, engage. What are you observing? And I'm like, no. Or even I saw some tweets by some people in high profiles, like positions, tweeting things that I'm like, that's not true, is it? And then I'm Googling it and I'm like, I can't see the proof for this. And I'm like, why do people do this? And my partner has to then remind me be like, Brittany, nobody ever researches it. And I'm like, but it's just like two clicks away. Like I just Googled it and it's like, you can see. And I'm like, why don't people do that? And I'm like, I can't, like, what is it, you know? And I realized like, as I'm on social media, I love social media. This is social media. Like, I'm so lucky to talk to you guys. I'm so lucky to be here. But oh my gosh, it is really there to twist and move you and manipulate you in a direction. You know, I get so many comments from people. Brittany, can you talk about this? No one's talking about this from our side. Brittany, can you talk about this? No one's talking about it from our side. And I'm in a position where I'm like, everyone's talking about it from both your sides. And I'm over it because no one is being objective about anything. And there is no objective when it comes to human beings being so where they are in their evolution that like they'd rather destroy than build. Every time something is destroyed, it is a participant participation from everybody. The moment you see someone build, that is a reflection of everybody. If you see a neighborhood that's really nice and built up, that's a reflection of the neighborhood. If you see a neighborhood that's run down and everyone's breaking into everyone house, everyone's houses, that's a reflection of the neighborhood. If you see a country that's gun violence after gun violence and everyone's getting shot up, that's a reflection of a country. If you see, do you get what I'm saying? If you had a whole group of people that were building and peaceful, that's what you would see because there wouldn't be any murder to see. And so I'm having a problem with how easily people are just like falling for things, even people that I think should be able to research this. Like what? It's so interesting, you know? I never trust tweets or TikToks that are only a few sentences or seconds. It only gives you the slice of the pie without any substance or evidence of the topic. Literally. So many lies on TikTok. To be fair, we psychologically primed by everything in our life. The best way to uh, mitigate the impacts is to create a pause between your thought evoked, the feeling, and the action you take. True. True. And success. So I must be part See, of that. That cult. is a diversionary tactic. 
in the sense. So you can think that survival means two meals a day, or you can think survival means Bentley. So it'll keep you busy a little longer. Still survival process. As long as the survival, there's an instinct of survival, and there is a longing to expand within the human being. So, for most human beings, these two things are mixed up. It is their instinct of survival which is finding expression as their longing to expand. So it doesn't matter who you are, where you are, anybody, you want to be something more. If that something more happens, you want to be something more. You can go on like this, how much more? Whatever you want, if I make it true for you right now. Next moment, you'll be thinking, what more? Suppose I make you the king of not England, the planet. <laughs> Don't look at me hopefully, I will, <laughs> no. I will not commit such a blunder <laughs> Suppose... I love Sadhguru's tennis shoes. We make you the king of this planet, will you be fulfilled? No, you will look at the moon, you look mm. at the other planets, you look at the other galaxies. If I give you one galaxy, you'll say, what about the other galaxy? Because there is something within a human being which... Okay, what is the difference between never being content and innovation? Okay, so that's what I would ask myself, right? What's the difference between being never being content and innovation? Okay, I'm writing notes in my own notebook here. Because obviously what he's describing is like an inner relationship you're having with your consciousness. And it's saying, when are you just going to be content and happy and settled? Versus some people might hear, so you want me to be lazy and you don't want me to innovate and you don't want me to make a skyscraper or go to the moon or touch Mars? Maybe. Maybe if everyone was satisfied with the simplicity of existence, taking a walk, breathing in some air, making some bread. Maybe we would never go to Mars. Maybe we'd never discover the cure for a disease. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I think life itself pushes us to innovate, right? Necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah, I think the reality is that like people get sick and you don't need to go to Mars to get sick, right? So like we would figure out the cure for diseases because like people get sick on this planet alone. We don't have to go to Mars to get sick. Like he said, you didn't need a pandemic to worry about people dying. People were already dying. And I agree with that. I think it's easy to say, oh, I, I care about human life now because this thing is happening. But you never cared about it. You only cared about it the way you could in the way that you could, right? <clears throat> Nero says, sorry if this is annoying, but do you think the media is a little too biased being on Israel's side? It's too complex of an issue for that. I think depending on the bubble you're in, Everyone is too biased. The side of the internet I'm on, it's all Palestine. When I, I have to work to find pro-Israel stuff. So then when I hop onto the other side of the bubbles and I see all pro-Israel stuff, it's not where I am. My bubbles, where I get my news and research and things, all pro-Palestine. When I hop onto other people's bubbles, it's all pro-Israel. So I'm getting way too much biased information on both sides, right? Because... That's what the media does because it's a team. There is a side. No one in this fight or this race is fighting for human life. They're fighting for their human life. Only theirs. And I'm saying, what if humans fought for human life? But what is valid human life? Are we going to save all the lives of the rapists in the groups? What about serial cheaters? Should we save all the husbands that beat their wives or daughters? How about the brothers that stone their sisters or the parents who stop their, who force their children into childlike marriages? Or like, which human life do we really value, right? As a pro-choice person who thinks like you are ending human life in progress, to me, I'm saying maybe it's worth ending a life so you can pay your bills. And that's, that is what abortion is. We're saying I'm willing to end a life because I can't afford a baby right now, right? So when we're having these conversations about I value human life during the pandemic, right? People on my parents' side of the issue were told they didn't value human life. But from my parents' perspective, right? They value human life. That's why they're pro-life. But in my mind, I value human life. That's why I'm pro-choice. The irony is there, right? Because they're pro-life but are pro-war. And I'm pro-choice but anti-war. 
And I'm not anti-war, like strictly I'm saying like we shouldn't have to go to war, right? So it is interesting. Nero says, oh, interesting. Here it is just and completely and only Israel side, Germany. So that's why probably, yeah, that makes sense, right? Like that makes sense. And that's the problem. No matter what, none of our hands are clean. And all of us as individuals might have cleaner hands than others. But as groups, you know what I mean? I'm on the side of innocent siblings. Yeah, me too. Which side is that, right? And I think that's the hardest part about life. So what's the difference from con being content and innovation, right? Levy says, uh, I think the grind set is unhealthy. Everyone should be the balance, should be balanced in my opinion. And in the absolute chunk working, wait, Brittany, dyslexia, Bill, hold on. I think the grind set is unhealthy. Everything should be in balance, in my opinion. The absolute chunk working takes out of the la our lives and how normalized it is, is deadly to the human spirit. And yet, it's oh, people have always worked harder than they're working now, right? And that's curious to me. Like, why do we think we're working harder now than our ancestors? Because I know for a fact, I am not working as hard as my ancestors did or as my parents had to work. But to be fair, I work harder to attain what they attained in a way. Like their hard, their work was more labor intensive, but they got more reward for it, the baby boomers, I guess. Like my parents were able to buy a home at 40 for 230,000, I think, 250,000, and now it's worth a million dollars. And they sold that house for, house for 700,000 and bought their new house for 500 and then paid off that house. Versus me, like I'll be lucky if I can afford a $200,000 condo or apartment. Like my goal is just to try to buy like a two to $300,000 apartment. Like if I could buy that, I'd feel pretty okay. But like I don't even know if I'm going to be able to afford that realistically in the next five to ten years. Because like I have a middle class living. Like and I'm making more than the average person. You know. Is curiosity separate from discontentment? I think so. Um, well, I think they're different things. Is curiosity separate from discontentment? Well, I think they're different for sure. Right? I think you can be curious and be content. Like I'm very content, but I'm always curious. And then I think you can be um, discontented and searching desperately for the thing to make you content. So yeah, I think I, I would be the definition of curious but content or content but curious, you know. And then there are people that are like, I, when I was younger, I was not content. I was the opposite. I was so just aggravated and frustrated that I was looking for this thing. What was I looking for? And the answer was like, I was looking for a relationship with my consciousness. I was looking for a relationship with myself. One that was healthy and fulfilled and reasonable and rational, rational and healthy, you know? She wants to expand limitlessly. Is that not a good thing? Is that not, not the I, reason why? I didn't, I didn't say it's not good. I'm just saying you have constipated that longing to expand. Mm, That's why you say... I'm not saying it's not good. Do you love that? When I say constipated, right now you want to expand limitlessly. Can you expand this body limitlessly? No. Please don't. <laughs> Don't try. In the gym, can. I've tried, but... <laughs> 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 so physical expansion is a limited expansion, and your longing is to expand limitlessly because there is something within you which doesn't like boundaries. The moment, see, if I imprison you in a five by five cubicle, you will feel terribly imprisoned. Then tomorrow I will announce your liberation and release you into ten by ten cubicle. You will feel wonderful for two days. Then you will feel horribly imprisoned. Then we will release you into a hundred by hundred cubicle. You will be fine for a week, after that you will feel miserable. Doesn't matter where I set the boundary. Once you feel the boundary, you want to break it. So there is something intrinsic within you which doesn't like boundaries. This is a consequence of the evolution that you've gone through. Once your cerebral cortex flowered, now you don't like boundaries, but you're trying to expand in an infinite way by counting one, two, three, four, five. Can you ever count one, two, three, four, five and one day say infinity? No. You'll only get into endless counting. That's all that's happening. That's why I said your longing to expand is a limitless process. 
But right now you're constipated. You're going one little step at a time. Constipation means just this. It happens little by little. <laughs> So, so is it a case of trying to find a balance between your ambition to expand and to no, grow and be successful no, no, no. and peace? Why should you find balance? You oh. must expand. Okay, so I, that's but, what I'm doing. Yes, no. Mm. What is the means mm. to become a boundless expansion? If Ooh, okay, I don't know what he's going to say, but I'm going to guess. How do you expand while being content? And how do you not mistake hustling for expansion? Right? Because you must always grow. Like sometimes when I talk about the levels, this my level system of introspection, people are like, oh, Brittany thinks five is the end goal. Five is not the end goal. I never said that. And if I said that, I was wrong. Past Brittany was dumb. I don't mean that, right? If I said that, I was wrong. Five is not the end. Five is the end of my work. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm teaching people. If you guys want to do it, you don't have to do it. Fuck it. Stupid. Don't do it, right? It doesn't matter. It only matters if it helps you. But it can help you or it can help you right? But it's not the end of anything. Because like, you're still growing, you're still learning, you're still expanding, but I'm still content. Like I'm a very content person, but I'm still curious and I'm still expanding and I'm still growing. You know what I mean? There's so many different journeys to go on, so many different things to do, but I want to do them in a content way where I never feel like I'm running out of time and I never feel like, oh my God, what if I don't do this in my lifetime? Like there's no FOMO. I've, I've, FOMO is not a thing I'm worried about, right? Do I feel the stresses of the world? Sure. Do I sit there and I'm like, mm, no. In my life, super content. Again, my life is great. I like me. It's when I'm dealing with other people that life can get very frustrating. And that's when you're like, oh my gosh. And usually when you're not content, I feel like you're usually fighting some sort of expectation that you've decided you have to reach by someone else's timeline. Because the timeline you should give yourself is the one that makes sense for who you are, right? B-Dog, are you reviewing other gurus? Well, uh, have we reviewed gurus in the past? Oh, yeah. I guess we just did the Scientology guy, which is that a guru? Ew. We're doing Sidguru, who is a person. And he's on the diary of the CEO. We've linked the, in chat. And we're watching him right now. If you look at that, then we say consciousness. This is what raising human consciousness means. Because you realize physical expansion is not a realistic thing. We can make physical arrangements as we want, as we need for our convenience and comfort, but that is not the way to expand. Expansion needs to happen in a way that it's not physical in nature. Then you can also own the universe, I can also own the universe. When, when, I, when I look at the way we're living our lives in the Western world. What, you talked about the WHO. They describe stress as an epidemic sometimes, and they say it's a major contributor to the diseases that we're undergoing. Um, we're, I'm trying to figure out in my life where I'm going, if there's anywhere I'm going wrong. Because I've I'm building these businesses, and I'm, you know, and I, I sometimes See, ask myself, to what end, you know? When you say, where am I going wrong? The wrong is this, the fundamental wrong is this. Mm. What is not you, if you think it's you, mm. then you're trapped in that. If mm. you think that I am this chair, because we sat on this chair for a period of time, if you think you're this chair, now this chair will go with you, stuck to your backside, wherever you go. That's a very ugly thing to do, isn't mm. it? It's the same thing right now. Your thought, you think it's you, your emotion, you think it's you, you, you physiological stuff, you think it's you. It's pretty ugly. It's just because everybody's got this st uh, chair stuck to the backside, it looks like it's normal. Yeah. Mm. After all, it's convenient. Wherever you go, you don't have to look for a chair. You got a chair fixed. If I identify with all these things, if I identify with this chair, you're saying that that becomes a That's way to... That's all. The thing is, your identity, whatever you're identified with, that becomes a part of you. And is that what's causing us a lot of our despair? Yes. If you sit here just as life, what is your problem? I as long no as you're alive, everything is problem. A lot of our despair. Yes. If you sit here just as life, what is your problem? Okay. So this is what I would describe as when I do like my um, work with people and I and I am talking about philosophy, right? And that's what I'm doing. And I'm talking about spirituality, I suppose. But I'm talking about mostly 
uh, we do this core exercise I do with people where I put them in an imaginary scenario where they're by themselves. And I say, now what? And it's interesting what people decide to do with that time, right? Some people are are thinking about escaping. Some people are thinking about hiding. Some people are thinking about their friends. Some people think about like, well, how do I get out? Everyone has a different relationship when I put them through this thought exercise. But what stands out to me the most is, is when they realize what I'm saying, when I'm like, just imagine you're sitting in this room. Like imagine that all of us are just sitting here. What is the problem? Why do we create problems? Ideology? belief, pride, ego, we create problems. My kids are worth saving, but your kids aren't worth saving. Hell, if I have kids that don't follow my belief system, they're not even worth saving. You create your problems with your beliefs. You think your beliefs are real, so you have meaning and your ego gets boosted, and so you create problems. Why should there ever be a problem in the world unless we make it a problem? I have no enemies. I have no problems. I have only conflict and conflict came from somewhere and I participated in it whether I like it or not, which is why you have to leave the conflict because it takes two to make it, right? When you're in a toxic relationship, you are adding to the conflict and you can still be a victim, but it takes you being there to make the conflict, which is why it's amazing when people can get out Because you've stopped the cycle, right? So again, when you've realized, like, I'm just sitting here, dude. I'm good. Have you ever been, like, to a park and you're just minding your business and then somebody starts a fight? If we all just, as strangers, as even as humans, we do this pretty well. Like, human beings in general get along relatively well-ish. Like, look at us. Our whole world. I live in an apartment with, like, hundreds of people. I, I, in public, I'm shopping with like dozens of people. I'm walking up and down the streets with strangers every day. And most of the time, I'm never bothered, right? Heck, most of the time. Now imagine if we did that 10% more, 50% more. No matter what you do in life, when conflict arises, it will get bigger the more you add to it. So when people say, being neutral or staying out of something isn't isn't a valid choice. The more people that stay out of it, the better. Because then all you have is the people involved in it and then you know who's creating the conflict. But at the same time, sometimes humans refuse to see that they're creating the conflict. And so you have to create a bigger conflict. And it's all just awful. It's all awful. Creating bigger conflicts to stop smaller ones is just as bad as the small ones that got started. Okay? One time I was at a pizza place vibing. This guy came up to the counter and started yelling and filming the coworkers or the workers out of nowhere. I assume they were a TikToker. Did you ever stand up to your bullies in school? No, I didn't. I transferred out of my school and I went to independent study and I went on with my life. But no, I didn't. You can't. You can't stand up. You can't always stand up to people who are going to lie, right? So you're just like, eh, what are you going to do, right? It was really sad, though. My example is probably different, though. I wasn't, you know what I mean? But no, I... uh, at the time, I didn't know how to stand up for myself in that way. So the way I, I stand up is like like by leaving and not creating more conflict. I can't deal with people lying. Like lying is really difficult for me because I'm like, what? No. Like you can't lie. Like you can't untangle a lie. And that's the problem. Right? Like I, my bullies were women. Right? They don't hit you or get violent. They lie about you and ruin your reputation. And it's hard to like. You know what I mean? You can't beat up a girl because she starts a rumor about you. It's illegal. (laughs) It's literally what got me expelled out of high school. But like, no, you don't beat up people because they lie about you. Grow up. Like, be an adult. You know what I mean? And at the same time, like, I no, It's like Luffy and Zoro. When the pirates were mocking them 
and pretending that they were smarter and bigger than them. And then they just sat there and they're like, no, like we're not going to engage and prove our strengths to them because they're not even worth it. Like, no, bullies aren't worth it. Bullies are just like, they're not worth it to me to get expelled over and to ruin my reputation over. Like, no way, dude. No way. I don't live in a bubble where you can assault your, your bullies, right? Like, it makes sense if you live in a bubble where you're allowed to do that. But like, I wouldn't, I don't hit people. Like I told you, I've never hurt, I've, I don't hit people, right? Like, I'm an adult. Like, okay, I'm a grown up. Hitting people is like, you move to violence. You chose conflict. Like, you chose violence. I just, unless it's in self-defense, it's not okay, right? I just don't think that's valid. As long as you're alive, everything is fine. Yeah. So the only problem is you're identified with things that you're not. Mm. So the whole lot of confusion about everything. So if you're successful, you suffer. If you're failure, you suffer. If you're... See, look at the thing. Is there one thing that human beings are not suffering? Just tell me. Somebody's poor, they suffer their poverty. Somebody becomes rich, they suffer the taxes. No children, they suffer that, give them children every day, pain, something or the other. So it looks like whole life is suffering. So somebody makes a philosophy, whole life is suffering, you must go to heaven. If you know that much, why are you not gone? You are not gone because you don't know a damn thing. Whether oh shit, Sadhguru talking mad shit right now on the religious people? Whether there is a place better than this somewhere or not, you don't whole life is suffering, you must go to heaven. If you know that much, why are you not gone? You are not gone because you don't know a damn thing. Whether there is a place better than this somewhere or not, you don't know. You're just claiming these things to somehow fix your psychological sloshing that's happening inside. You're making up things to somehow believe something so that your psychology won't just splash all over the place and go crazy. Mm, do you hear what he said? We create beliefs, right? So our psychology doesn't splash all over everything, right? Oh, my kid's gay because God's giving me suffering so I can offer it up for the sins of the world. Oh, my husband beats me because I need to suffer because, you know, it's like we create these games. Our beliefs are the cause of everything that's wrong with the world. That's why I say with my work at least, I want to specify what is something we know and something we believe. Because right now the world is run off of a belief. Multiple, millions, billions of them. I believe this, so this is true. Right? And then we create an ego around it and then we make it our identity like he was saying. And then all of a sudden here we are. Here we are, right? Hmm trying to hold yourself in place, telling yourself fairy tales, all right? So, what I'm saying is, do you believe that if you want to navigate your life through this time that we have, in a sensible manner, the most important thing is to see life as is, as it is. As it is. If I don't see in this room things as they are. I will walk into this table, I will bump mm. into somebody, I will do crazy things every day. If I see very clearly, navigating myself through all these cables and tripods is not a big problem. Hello? But if I don't see, if there's no clarity of vision, if I'm not seeing things as they are, then what a mess it is, every little thing, that's all the problem, problem is. Not that what you're doing is wrong, the way you're seeing it is wrong. How do I... How do I know the way I'm seeing it is wrong? What is the evidence of that or the symptoms uh, of that? As you're giving me the evidence from statistics, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the evidence. Mm -hmm. So I am not like that. Obviously you're here, I'm here, so both of us didn't commit suicide, so we are not in the statistic. Mm -hmm. That's not the point. You think those people who committed suicide, everything was wrong with their life? No. Not everything was wrong with their life, a few things. As it goes wrong in your life, my life, everybody's life, some things don't work, all right? In everybody's life, something doesn't work in the outside world. If everything is working for you, obviously you're living a very petty life. 
In my life, ninety-five percent of the things that I want doesn't happen, only five percent happens. Because I'm trying to fix everything in the world, most of the things don't happen. Mm, mm. Okay, there's so much to say. Oh, I should have been taking notes, but I was eating my cookies. Okay. Okay. Mm. There's so much to say. Okay. Okay. Human beings in general, we rely on belief to get us through the day. I believe people won't run a red light, which allows me to trust traffic lights and follow the rules of the road because I believe people are going to follow the rules of the road, right? So that is a belief. It's not something I know, right? I... You ever have this moment in your life where you're pretty sure you turned off the stove, but you can't trust yourself, so you walk back into the house to check? Do you ever have that happen? Why do you need to double check an action you did if you just did it 15 seconds ago? Because in that moment, you don't know, but you believe you did the right thing. I was on stream just like a few weeks ago, and I said, I think I turned off the stove. I'm pretty sure. Oh, but now I don't know. I'm doubting myself and I had to run and go check. Even though I did it, I did turn off the stove. I doubted myself because I, I didn't know. I believed I did it, but it wasn't good enough. Sometimes in life, your belief isn't good enough and that's when you double check. And then sometimes in life, your belief is strong enough that you don't go and double check the stove, right? Everyone is having a relationship with belief and knowing. And most people are more than content to live their life off belief right? I believe, I know, and my belief in myself is so strong, I don't need to double check. But if you have like a doubt and you know you don't know and it's not good enough, you would double check. But when it comes to life, like your partner, your relationship, your religion, everything else, people are having what I call a bubble pop when the belief isn't strong enough to feel like you know. So when you're questioning God, you're like, oh, I went from knowing God was real, but now I'm starting to question if God is real, which means my belief is faltering, which means my belief was something that was the reason I knew, but a belief isn't something you know. And so all of a sudden you're having a bubble pop of like, oh no, do I not know if God is real? Did I only ever believe God was real? And if I only believed God was real, what am I basing my life off of, right? <clears throat> I chuck that up to a lack of self-confidence in my own ability. That could be a part of it. It's multifaceted. It could be a part of you not trusting yourself enough to believe in yourself, enough to know. Like somebody asked me, how do I become confident? Well, I have enough proof in my judgment. Like how they, they would ask me, how do you know you married the right person? Well, I'm really trusting my knowledge of myself to make this decision. I've lived and I've made enough mistakes to now have such a strong knowledge and belief in myself that I know I can make this decision, right? But everyone's having different example. This can be applied a multitude of ways. I think Ingrid Lefta said, I don't think belief is escapable. It's not supposed to be. I don't think there's a harm in having a belief. I think there's a harm when your belief hurts other people, hurts yourself, is the cause for conflict, is what leads to destruction. Everyone, if everyone had the belief that no one was going to hurt them and then nobody hurt each other, that'd be great because it'd also be a part of knowing, though it's not an objective knowing because they can't account for 8 billion people, right? But if everyone believed no one will hurt me, but every one, every one in two people stabs you, your belief is wrong because it's not rooted in knowledge. And at that point, you have evidence because one, like half the population is stabbing you, Right? So you can have this belief that some or half of the population won't hurt you. And that would be true because you would have the evidence, right? So I don't think you need to escape belief. I believe my electricity will keep running tonight and I can stream. If I had the belief that like, oh no, there's a storm outside and I'm going to have electricity so I shouldn't stream, I could keep myself away from streaming and that could be just as valid and saying, hey, I'm just going to be cautious. I believe the storm is going to cause an outage. I'm not going to stream. Or because I think it's more likely that the stream won't cause an outage because it's not that bad of a storm, right? Or the, the storm won't cause an outage because it's not that bad of a storm. I would say, well, I believe the storm's not going to cause an outage. I don't know that. So I'm going to stream, right? A belief is a great thing. 
But when the belief is, oh, um, uh, the belief is I'm going to stone my child's death because they're queer or trans. Hmm. Well, the, the belief is now questionable, right? At least I think the child might have a question. If your belief is women are second class citizens, if your belief is you shouldn't marry outside of your own ethnicity, maybe, but why? Why do you think that, right? If your belief is God is real and I am going to heaven and you're not, okay. But then if you use that as a reason to discriminate or hurt people or rape people or, well, now your belief, there's a problem, right? There's no problem with belief in and of itself. The problem is what you use the belief for. So he's saying we often use a belief to cripple ourselves because of the relationship we're having with the perception, right? <clears throat> okay, I'm just catching up on your comments. Okay. So if anybody wants to die of frustration, it must be me. But I will not, because no matter what, I will die blissed out. I live blissed out, I die blissed out. <laughs> because what I do, what the situation is around me and how I am are never connected. I am the way I am. I'll do my best. Has, has it required you to train yourself to sort of disattach from... It is... No, no, no. See, uh, this is all because... See, the problem is too much... Uh, <laughs> Spiritual jargon is going all over the world because every idiot who's read two books can write his next book. <laughs> Sad guru be throwing punches. Oh my God, he's so funny, bro. He literally was like, fuck y'all's fake scams, bro. He's like, fuck your period. He's like, fuck you, Andrew Tate. <laughs> <laughs> if you read two books, you, there was a time when people read 10 books and then wrote one book that was called plagiarism. Now they read two books and they write the third book. <laughs> that is so fucking funny. <laughs> See, your, your background is full of books. I hope you've not read all of them. I've only read two and I'm writing one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because just about everybody is writing. It's all right. It's freedom of expression. They can write what they want. But these are two things. There is expression and there is perception. Mm. Which should you invest in more? Perception. If you perceive well, your expression will be valuable. Mm. Right now, everybody's on an expression binge without perceiving a damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> True, based. Mm. Okay, I do want to make it clear that I am... This is why I call myself... I told my partner the other day, I was like, I feel like I need to explain to people that I'm like a student, but I'm just like an upper level, but I'm a student still. I don't feel like a teacher. I feel like a student. I feel like I'm saying, hey, I discovered this much about life. Do you guys want to like figure out this much? Okay. And then when I get to the next part, I'll like talk about that as well. That's why I think my YouTube audience has always grown with me. Like I feel like I'm still a student who's learning, but I figured out this section and I'm just like basically like I'm a senior and I'm showing the freshmen and eh, what's up. But I'm still, and then when I'm like graduated and I have like my master's eventually in life, I'll like go back and you know what I'm saying? I feel like I'm a chronic student and I hope to be my whole life. And I don't want to give off this impression that I'm like, I literally think I'm in teacher place yet. I don't think I've earned that right to be a teacher. I think in my 40s and 50s, I'll definitely be more closer to it. But I do feel like I'm just saying like, hey, I learned this thing. Do you want to know what I learned? Cool. I hope it helps you, bro. And I can help you along with that. But then when you go to the other like place, like you got to do that with somebody else because like I don't I'm not there. Like I don't do that. Right. And I think that's what my my key role is in this life is that when I'm engaging with people is to remind them that like I'm also a student. I just discovered this part like so, you know. 
But that's why everyone has mentors. That's why when Dr. K asks, like, who do you have a mentor? Who's your mentor? Because, like, you're never done learning, right? If you're a chronic student. And you don't need a literal mentor. Everyone's your mentor. But even when you watch, like, Graham Stephan, he's learning from the guys who have made more money. Or you're you're watching, like, I really appreciate people who have reached a certain level and are still learning. And so I always want to make sure that I'm still learning, you know? <clears throat> there will be so many people that are going through stress at work in their relationships in their household listening to this going how how do i live blissed out like he does <laughs> like what what's step one in that staircase well i'll tell you see whatever you call it you call it by whatever name you want stress anxiety tension depression bipolar this one that one many things I was talking to some of the top uh, psychiatrists in UK and they told me there are 72 varieties 72. of psychological ailments. Love that. I thought there may be half a dozen. But they said there are 72 varieties of psychological ailments. I was really surprised, 72, that's like a golf game. Yeah. You know? <laughs> It's like a dad joke. Then I asked, what are these? They told me quite a few things. One of the things they told was compulsive nose picking. Even if they're bleeding in the nose, they can't stop it. That explains everything in a way, compulsive nose picking. Leave the nose picking, it's compulsiveness. You're compulsive in your thought, compulsive in your emotion, compulsive in your actions, that's all the problem is. How do you fix compuls uh, compulsiveness? If this room is dark, how do you fix it? Hold on. Yeah, yeah, says, Brittany, do you think you could take what he's saying more seriously than other gurus because of his nationality? If he was a white woman, do you think he, you'd think, still think he was a five? Um, like, again, being a five, um, yes, because, like, if she was, if a white woman was saying what he was saying and she actually, like, felt like she lived it and it made sense and it felt authentic, like, being a five is not special. It just feels It's not, like, even, I don't even believe in the word guru. Like, that's a construct created by people, right? So, I'm just curious, not assuming, not saying he couldn't be a five. I just grew up around this, and I was listening to speeches like this weekly. He's not saying anything more. But, like, the thing is, is, like, <sighs> there is nothing to say. When you get to a five, it's like being a two again. You're like a child. Don't hurt people. You probably don't know as much as you think you know. You don't know anything. Right? We all just sit here in our egos pretending we know something. And all we know is what we know in the moment. My work is centered around exactly what's happening in a moment. One of the reasons I'm not talking about Israel and Palestine is because that's not a moment. That whole thing, I can't observe it except in the moment. And in the moment, you all should stop fighting. But that's not helpful to people who have been fighting a war for 75 years. Right? Because when, again, like, A war that's lasted 75 years is a war between bubbles. Like it's, it's not, they can't even stop. No one will stop and it won't stop. Just can't stop, won't stop. Because like they, they can't, it's too in their identity. Like he said, your identity has now been this thing and this is your identity, right? So like, I can't go to them and say like, give any insight. So when you're a five, All you're saying is like, hey, do you know we're human beings and we don't know what we're doing and we're searching and we could be spending our time doing anything else? And do you know like if you just sat in a room and you never heard anyone, like no one would ever be hurt? And do you know if you just like walked along the road and actually like built up streets instead of destroying streets, the world would be better? And hey, did you know that like if we all work together, but we can't all work together. And so the radical acceptance of the five is that you'll never have that utopia because everyone's on a journey. But it's radically accepting that everyone's on a journey. You will never have world peace because you will have humans. If you want world peace, no humans. Period. Humans are the cause of conflict. And we have to experience that conflict because we're all on a journey. The moment you have a baby, you add conflict into the world. That's it. So I don't know if he's a five, right? I don't know him. But the way he talks sounds like it. Because right now he's talking about different bubbles. So he's aware of bubbles. And he's disregarding belief versus knowledge. So he knows the differences. 
So I don't know if he's a five. And I don't think he's a five because he's a guru. I think guru is a bullshit title he probably uses in the two bubble. In the same way that look in my bubble, everyone's like, so what are you? And I'm like, what? And they're like, pick a word so we know what to call you. So he chose guru because he's Indian and he does yoga and that kind of makes sense. Sure. But like, what am I going to choose? I'm a Syrian from America. I could be a coach. That's kind of a lame title. I could be a YouTuber, but that's not good enough, right? People don't like that. I, that's the one I'm using, but people don't like it. They're like, no, you talk with too much authority. So what are you? And I'm like, what? They're like, what are you? They want to put me in a box. And if I chose a box, I could probably sell more, more books or YouTube videos. People who, who listen to Sid Guru, I think some of them listen to him and don't understand him. And then some people listen to him and think they get him. And then some people listen to him. They're like, I think I know what he's saying. Like, I'm doing that. I'm like, I think I know what he's saying. I'm going to translate it in the way that I think he's saying it. But I could be wrong. Right? But he did package himself really well for the bubbles to consume him. Right? I, I can't do that. And like, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I refuse. I can't. He does it really well. And honestly, a big part of it is probably because he's like, eh. You know what I mean? It doesn't make him less than a five because he chooses a shtick that works really well with the twos. He could be a two. You know what I mean? But I don't know. Because the truth is, is like he's into activism and I'm not. So as like my personal desire for the world is not activism. Um, but that is his. He wants to save the planet. He wants to put effort into this. I don't think he thinks it's going to happen. I think it still makes him feel fulfilled though. Like I don't, ha I don't feel fulfilled by activism. Because again, like, listen to me, you're adults, stop fighting and stop killing each other. And they're like, no. And I'm like, oh, okay, have fun. If you're reasonable, logical adults, and I say, stop, ch stop cheating on your wife. And they go, um, no. Okay. What do you want me to do, buddy? What do you want me to do? Like, what do you, like, why would I dedicate my life to activism when you can't even simply stop? right? You can't even figure out you need to stop, right? On a mass scale, impossible to solve. But on an individual scale, when people are ready, if they want to stop, we'll talk about it. But when people aren't ready, they're not ready, right? I can't force the world to be ready to stop being violent. I can only sit here and wait for the world to figure it out, which it won't, because there will always be new babies who are back into the cycle of, I'm going to have violence and I'm going to, so I don't choose to be an activist. He, again, he could be any level. I don't know. But some fives could choose to be activists. Why not? Some fives could choose to probably be cult leaders. I don't know why they would. That doesn't sound very efficient. But you know, it will never happen. Humans are born with corruption. Ooh, think of it. I'm sure there's someone in your life you have hate for and will never let go of that hate. No, humans are not born with corruption. Wrong. And absolutely, what good is hate? Absolutely hard disagree. Humans are born neutral. And absolutely, hate is not necessary in life. There is nobody in my life that I hate. And I will, a there's absolutely wrong. Like, absolutely wrong. What good is hate? It's bad for your skin and it's bad for your hair. Like, and humans are not born corrupt. What? No. Let's do one thing, both of us fight with this darkness and push it out of the window. There's no such thing, if you turn on the light, it's gone. So, there is no substitute for consciousness. If you become conscious, compulsive behavior is gone. Suppose you are in thought, emotion, action and energy, you are not compulsive. That you can create whatever thought you want, whatever emotion... Mm, okay. I would call this like free will versus not. So I'm not in the place right now where I'm always activating my free will or my present, like in my present self, not to mistake therapy language for living in the present. That's different than meditative living in the present. So for me, right, what I hear him say that I'm hearing, oh, the differences between when I'm, that's why I say I'm still a student, right? I'm not at the point yet 
where I am always acting within my free will. I have to evoke it in the same way that I think we all have to, which is like being in the consciousness, like recognizing it, thinking about it, and being in the moment, right? Versus acting on that impulse. That impulse is that like default mode. It's what we call bot mode or people will call like matrix mode or people will call like sheep mode. Everyone has a word for it, but everyone does it. Isn't that funny how everyone's like, they're sheep, they're bots. Look at yourself, girl. We all do this. So to, in order not to do it, you have to like practice living in the present in a meditative way. You have to practice like evoking your free will and saying like, okay, I'm I, mm, like, okay, how do I like live in the moment? How do I recognize this moment? You know, not the moment that happened two seconds ago, not the moment that I think might happen in the future, but the moment right now. Oh my God. <coughs> oh, fuck me, bro. Motion you want. Would you keep yourself blissed out or miserable? What's your choice? Blissed out. For yourself, every human being, for themselves, they want the highest level of pleasantness, so the intent is already there. You don't… I don't have to inspire them, be blissed out, there's no such uh, philosophy. Every human being wants the highest level of pleasantness for themselves. Those who think it's hopeless here, they're the ones who created heaven. They said, there is a place which is always pleasant. But they don't have any proof that we are all… we are not already in heaven and making a mess out of that. Hello? True. Do you think that True. Listen to that. Imagine if we realized like this was heaven or we could have that here, but we won't do it. We won't do it. We won't get along. We won't treat each other well. We won't do that. And everyone has a different idea of what well means. And that's the problem, right? <clears throat> oh my God. Oh, my nose. Thank you for the blessings. Woo Ugh. Oh, oh my God. Okay, hold on. You don't need to do anything more than what you did, you're did. you doing, sis. The few people you've affected that have learned things from you are affecting the people in their lives too. Small changes are huge. I agree 100%. I agree. Small. I believe in that. I really do. Yeah. I think we have equal parts evil and good inside of us. And the most valuable way, in my opinion, is to find the middle way between both. Mm, I can't vibe with that. What do you mean? Equal parts evil. I mean, things good or evil don't exist. They're constructs, right? Like you decide what's good and evil. It's not objective, right? There is no objective good or evil. There's only what we've decided is good or evil and by what metric we're basing it on. So I think we all have the potential to evoke evil or goodness, but I don't think it's in us. I think it's, it's something we evoke in the moment, right? Is, is Are you evil if you just sit on your couch and you never talk to a person ever again? Or is evil when you evoke it into action? You know what I mean? Or maybe you're being e evil to yourself, I suppose. But what do you mean by that? Like, I don't think there, I don't need to have a really, I don't think any part of me is evil. Like that is, I do not believe that. What part of me is evil, girl? I just want to watch some fucking anime and eat some chicken. Like, what did I do? What is evil? When I think of evil, I think of people who want to like, maybe rape a baby or genocide a whole population. Like, what are we talking about here? And even like what, they're probably doing that because of their religion, because religion's crazy. But like, what part of you is evil, girl? The part of you that wants to eat too many donuts today? Like, what is this evil? You know what I mean? I don't know if we're defining evil the same way. You know? <clears throat> Freedom says, um, I hate no one, but ask myself whether we are really born neutral or not. Can you speak on why you think this is the case? Well, I see human beings as animals and I think that we're just born and we're alive and then we're born, our consciousness is trapped in this thing we call a body and then the relationship we have between our consciousness and the body is um, kind of just neutral. It just is. Like it's not good or evil. I like to – emotionally, I like to say all humans are good because they're trying their best. But realistically, I think especially babies or when you're born, it's all just very neutral. Like it's just a thing. Like it hasn't, you know, it just exists. Like is a lion good or evil? Like aren't they, it's just an animal. Like it's all neutral, like until it isn't, you know? Like a dog is a good dog or a bad dog based off how we think they should act. But <clears throat> when a baby is born, when we're born, we're just there. 
Like we're just there. In the beginning stages of life, we're just there. And then we're learning and we're figuring out what to do with this thing, right? We're learning how to make a choice or how to exist in the world. But it doesn't feel like we're born good or bad. You know, some people are born what I call like extremely defective. If they're born into a brain, like I watch this or I listen to this NPR series about children who basically at the five, at the age of like four or five, were ready to like murder their families. And I think we could all agree that that is a defective human and a consciousness is like, okay, like I think a consciousness sort of like exists within the body itself. Because look, guys, I could just like sit here and unalive myself right now and you would be like, oh, this thing that I call Britney killed itself. And in that moment, you have made me real. And in that moment, you're acknowledging that I am no longer here. What's this thing that's no longer here? It's not just a brain and it's not just a body. There is a relationship you're having with something more inside of me, which some people call a soul, some people call a consciousness, some people call a brain. But it's a thing. It's a thing that you're holding on to that you make real. And if I did that, it wouldn't just be a neutral action. I would impact people in a significant way that was almost on purpose, you could say, right? But like when a baby is born, it's just like a thing. And then this thing decides how to experience life. And at a stage, it just like it doesn't have a lot of choices, right? Because it's still developing. And then eventually it has more choices, right? So that's how I look at it. I think we're all animals on a planet. Like a dog is just a dog until a dog does something. Everyone's just human until they do something, you know? That's kind of how I see it. I don't want peace. I want problems. No, Soph. We want peace, not problems. <laughs> you know, you don't hate uh, sexual predators. No, I hate that people are hurt by sexual predators. I hate that. I don't hate the consciousness. I don't know them. And I don't, I, I don't like the action. Like I hate the action. I hate the pain. You know? You're cutting out for us. Oh my God, am I cutting out? Like, is my stream cutting out? The storm is bad. Wait, am I not here? Wait, why? What? Hello? Can you hear me at least? What's going on? Wait, hello? Wait, my stream has a black screen for some reason. Am I crazy? No, I'm there. Okay, we're back. Oh. Weird. Okay, it's been fine for some of you. Oh, okay, I'm back. I can see you now. I didn't get a notice from YouTube or anything that said I was doing anything. Interesting. Okay, well, hi. Okay, I am here. Okay, good. Okay, that's weird. I don't know what happened. We do have a storm right now, so it could have been just that or something. Okay, is my audio at least a little bit better? Some people are saying um, it's just going in and out. It keeps cutting out and you look super fuzzy. Hold on. YouTube or anything that said I was... Doing my replay on my YouTube looks good. Uh, are the Europeans having problems? Maybe. Maybe the Europeans are specifically having problems. Huh. That's interesting, actually. It could be. Okay. Um. Okay, yeah. So neutral, evil, blah, 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 blah. This is heaven. This is planet Earth and it's a fantastic place and it's the most fantastic place we have seen in the known universe. Do you think there's heaven though? Do you think huh? there's somewhere else we go to that is another world after this Everybody one? Everybody who thinks there is one, they must go today. <laughs> He's like, if you think there's a heaven, you better prove it, girl. Kill yourself. <laughs> Fuck. Hello. If they, if they have better accommodation somewhere than London, should they not go? <laughs> Did people not rush to America at one time? <laughs> Why are they not going? No, they want you to go. 
this is not good <laughs> it's true <laughs> see whatever kind of mental ailment you talk about essentially when your intelligence turn against you there is no power in the weird it's buffering hmm hold on is it youtube is it my internet hold on let me see hold on how do you do the stream thing how do you check it's i don't see anything but it's blurring uh my steve check hold on internet speed check 400, 380, 400, 410. Okay, and wait, I want an up and down, please. Global speed check. Let's do a speed check. Don't worry, fine for me in the UK. Okay, let's see. Everything's fine for some of you, but some of you don't, aren't fine. That's so weird. It's at 830 download, and we're at over 500 upload already. Yeah, my my connection be fire, bro. My connection be fire. Yeah, 516 upload, so 830 download and 500 upload. I'd be fire, bro, I'd be fire. Universe, which can help you, but why is my intelligence turn, turning against me? Somewhere we have not learned how to handle it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Your education systems, your society, nowhere is there anything to teach a child how to handle their own intelligence, their own emotions, their own thoughts. There is no such thing. All uh, fixing mechanic shop, mm -hmm. you know, repair jobs everywhere. Mm -hmm. Leave the repair jobs. The simple thing is this. The reason why... I mean, to be fair to the religious people, like, most of them aren't allowed to kill themselves or commit suicide. Like, they have to literally earn their right into heaven by putting up with earth. So to be fair, this is, like, their test. You know, you can't, like, skip the test and get the grade. And so to be fair, Sadhguru's argument doesn't quite work for that bubble because the bubble doesn't just believe there's a better place. They think they have to earn their place in that better place. You know what I'm saying? So to be fair to that bubble. Why people are struggling with this is they have, uh, pardon my words, but uh, otherwise people won't get it. They have a mental diarrhea. Oh. This doesn't create anything except distress. Anything that runs loose without your control is called diarrhea. Why has it happened? Even today, even if somebody gets physical diarrhea, Immediately somebody will pop a pill. But traditionally, what did we do? Somebody has diarrhea, first thing is, we understood we have eaten something wrong. First thing we did was, just don't eat, just drink water and wait. And next, identify what did I eat yesterday or today morning, <laughs> what happened to me? What is it that I consumed which caused this? And avoid that. But no, we will plug it in. No, if you plug it in... This man talk a lot about poop. I'm not a big fan of poop, you know. He be talking a lot about poop. It'll all rise within yourself. This is all that's happening. Right now, our way of doing life is very forceful. When I had mental diarrhea last time, Oof. the last time I, I had mental diarrhea, that kind of overthinking causes anxiety, all those no, things. No, 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 let me correct this. Okay. Oh. There is no overthinking. I'm oh. saying people are not thinking enough. True. This is a serious problem. But they think they're overthinking. They're not overthinking. It's a diarrhea. It's happening. Yeah, it's like people, when they, they're like, oh, Brittany, don't you think you overthink too much? I was like, sir, you're afraid to face your own death. You haven't even begun to think, sir. Overthinking is looping. This is what overthinking looks like. Maybe I should go to college. Oh, but if I go to college, it will cost a lot of money. Maybe I should go to college. Oh, but I can't afford it. Maybe I should go to college because it will get me a good job. Oh, but it, I won't be able to pay back my student loans in like 10 years. Maybe I won't go to college. Oh, but if I don't go to college, then people will think I'm, I'm bad and like people won't like me. Maybe I should go to college because if I go to college, people will like me. Oh, but then I have to pay back my student loans. Maybe I shouldn't go to college, but then I won't get a good job. Maybe I should go to college. Maybe I shouldn't go to college. Maybe I should go to college. Maybe I should go to, maybe I shouldn't go to college. I'm like, there's no thinking happening. It's just looping. Overthinking is looping. 
And then there's thinking, which is like, I could go to college. I could get a better job and I could pay off my student loans in 10 years. Or I could go to a trade school and not college and I could uh, not take out a loan and I could get a job in this career. Eh, that could work. I'll think about it a little bit more. Okay, overthinking is when nothing happens. Should I eat this cookie? If I ate this cookie, I'll, you know, I could get fat. Or I could just eat this cookie, but I could get fat. Or I could just eat this cookie, or I could get fat. I'm like, eh, eat the cookie, get fat. Who cares? <laughs> like, don't overthink it. Just eat the fucking cookie or don't. Okay? One is thinking where you're problem solving, and one is overthinking where you're looping. Why is it happening? Something wrong food has gone in. What is the wrong food? This is all it is. The moment you identify yourself with something that you're not, your mind, you cannot stop. Do what you want. Do whatever you want. It will not stop. So that, that anxiety that people experience where they start remunerating about the future or something that's happened, that is because... Th no, they've let me put it this way. This, this question, I understand what you're saying. See, what is it that human beings are suffering? What happened ten years ago, they're still suffering. What may happen day after tomorrow, they're already suffering. This is what you're saying. What happened ten years ago, is it here now? Does it exist? No. What may happen day after tomorrow, does it exist here? No. So if you're suffering something that does not exist, what does it mean? Tell me bluntly, if you're suffering something that doesn't well, exist it's like in, here... It's like insanity, but it feels like it exists. It is insanity. Yeah. It is insanity. Ooh. That's why I'm saying once Ooh. you start doing this, how far you go? When will you graduate? When will you end up in a doctor's place? When will you end up in an asylum? Is a question of time. But now, to world bodies are predicting it's going to happen large scale very soon. Let me give you an example. So someone... Oh, this man just like... I would be fucking, I'd be thriving in this conversation, bro. Why do I feel like no one, enge no one's, no one loves? Like when Dr. K talks, I'm like, yes. When Sadhguru talks, I'm like, fire. This guy is just like, so, so let me, he just said something so interesting. Why was there no engagement with what he just said? Like, it's because he's an interviewer. They have to be like professional. Oh man, that's what I mean. I, I wish I was like, I just want to have a conversation about like how interesting this is. As a sick child or, or they just lost their job. And they're thinking over and over again about, you know, oh my God, my child's going to die. I'm going to lose my job. And then I can't feed myself. I'm going to lose my house. Then I'm going to be on the street. That kind of rem remuneration and stress, that, that anxiety they experience on a day-to-day -day basis because they're scared of losing something which might, you know, they mm -hmm. believe will end them up on the street or lose their job or they won't be able to feed their family. That kind of torment. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to put those two things in the same level. Mm. Losing a child and losing a job, <laughs> all right? Yeah. Losing a child is a different thing. It's a completely different thing. Obviously, there will be a certain amount of pain in any human being. That's different. So, let us say such a terrible thing we had to face that we may lose our child. Mm -hmm. Tell me, can you do the best for the child if you are in your sanity? Or is it good to go into insanity? I feel like it takes a tremendous discipline. Now, what it takes, we'll see later. But I'm just asking a fun. <laughs> bro, fire, bro. Okay, it, well, it makes more sense not to go into insanity. Yes, sanity will make a difference. Well, Sadhguru is trying to teach him values. He's trying to say, do you value your child enough to stay sane? Which I think coincides with sort of like, I'm sorry, I love this TikTok trend. Hold on, let me find it for you while you guys listen to this. Hold on. Maybe we can save the child, maybe we cannot. Because all aspects of life we don't determine. Our experience we can determine. See, what happens in the world around you, even if you're just two people in the family, never will it happen hundred percent your way. If you try, Nobody will be around you. <laughs> it's as simple as that. I've read your story, so I know that there's moments in your life where you've lost people that you love. A lot of people, not one or... Okay, hold on. This reminds me of... This trend is actually like... 
kind of weirdly showing the strength and diversity of humans in a weird way. It says, POV, you're having a mental breakdown, but you remember you still have to be a mom. Okay. Okay, and so the idea behind it for me when I see stuff like this is like that is the complicated nature of being aware that like I'm having a breakdown, but I also have to be a mom or I have to be a dad or like like those two realities are so real for all of us. It's like half of people I know who got through college was like, oh, I was having a breakdown every week, but I passed finals. And I'm like, humans are really amazing. Like humans will go through like literally war. And somehow in, in 10 years, be like, life is beautiful. Everything is great. Everybody's a saint. I love life. Like people will literally experience like the worst times on this planet. And then like a, two years later, they're like, oh, I love life, man. Like life is great. And I'm like, humans are amazing and resilient and beautiful. And I think it's the relationship you're having with the reality, the radical acceptance. I think we talked about it in last night's stream. Like every time you look at your child and think, oh my gosh, I'm overwhelmed. I can't believe I have to take care of this baby and blah, blah, blah. I feel you, right? But like you would never want harm to befall on that child. And remember that for every moment your child goes swimming and doesn't die, there's a parent out there that just lost their kid to drowning, right? Like those parents would take five more days of their kids crying just to be around them. It's not to say you can't get frustrated. It's not to say you can't be tired. It's not to say you can't have a breakdown, right? But when you're able to like, Hey, I'm having kind of a breakdown, but also I'm still going to like manage my life. There's something about that balance that's really great. You know what I mean? Like I'm all about saying I'm tired. Hey, I'm at my, my, I'm at my wit's end. I need help. I need a support system. I need a community. But also I'm not a bad person because I'm tired. I'm, you know what I mean? But when you lose yourself to it, when you deny asking for help, when you internalize it so much that you erupt like a volcano, well, see, now you've lost yourself to it instead of realizing it was always going to exist and you could just have balance with it. You're going to get tired. You're going to burn out. How do we ask our community for help in these moments? You're not a bad parent because you get tired. But you're a bad parent if you become, you let yourself get so tired that you end up killing your child out of frustration because you didn't sleep enough. Do you get what I'm saying? We need to give tools to our society to not get so tired that they kill their children out of frustration because the human being, like the human body is biological and we're not perfect. And under enough lack of sleep, stress, lack of eating and all of that stuff, we do horrible things. And that's just the reality. I know for my borderline personally, I have to eat, drink and sleep properly. If I do not eat, drink, and sleep properly, I run the risk of being triggered and being a bad person. Like a bad person to myself mostly. My borderline is mostly inflicted on me. But that means I would be a bad partner. I probably wouldn't show up to work. I'd be a bad YouTuber. So, you know, I owe myself taking care of this physical form that holds my consciousness. And that's my responsibility. But so many parents, so many people in the world don't even know that's what's happening because they're told just hustle, just grind, get two jobs. You're lazy. Oh my gosh. How dare you be tired? How dare you be stressed? How dare you? We punish people for asking for help. And then we punish people for not asking for help. Can we not be a little bit better than this, please? Also, speaking of taking care of this physical form of mine, I told myself today I'm doing a 3 a.m. bedtime. It is 12.30 my time already. So we're going to finish out this segment, okay? And we're going to pause it. And I think we should continue this. Um, oh, today's Friday. <laughs> today's Friday. I can't stream tomorrow. I'm holding a Discord event tomorrow. Should we stream this on Monday? Okay, if we – or should I do a Discord event this weekend on Sunday? Do I have time to do it Sunday? Do I have another event Sunday? I want to finish this video. Hmm. What should I do? Hold on. I got to mm, I got to go to bed, which means I got to get going because I have to take care of this body of mine. We have yoga on Sunday, actually. We're doing yoga, professionally paid yoga on the Discord if you guys want to join us. 
um, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. CEST. Um, fuck. Okay. Well, we'll see how I feel Monday. Either we're going to continue this Monday or you guys can watch it on your own. Let's finish out this one segment. It just has like a minute or two left and then we'll talk for a bit and then I'm going to go because I promised myself I would stay on schedule. True. Because my family is so large, almost every other day I am burying somebody who's very dear to me. Same. My family's so large, like people are always dying. It's just what it is. Which one of those moments impacted you the most and did any of them drive you into the insanity that we're talking about? No. I don't let anything drive me into insanity. This is a brief amount of time that you have as life. Here we create many things. You're creating businesses. I have large movements where millions of people are involved. There are relationships. You cannot take these things lightly mm. because other lives are involved. But you cannot prevent anybody from dying. Mm. You can attend to them. If, uh, if something is going to happen to them, you can make attempts to save them, but you cannot prevent anybody from absolutely dying, including yourself. This is a fact. So the only two things that we have is a certain amount of time and a certain amount of energy. This is all that you call as life. What do you want to make out of it? You want to make a mess out of it, see, the thing is, first of all, they are living an emotionally constipated life. They only loved their child. I saw everybody as mine. Everything that happened hurts. But that's part of it. Yeah. If you walk in a forest, there are thorns in your feet. But this doesn't mean you don't enjoy the forest, all right? Mm -hmm. You have moments of sadness. Okay, we're going to pause it there. I think this is what I was trying to explain. Like, I feel like I love everyone because everyone is human and everyone's me because I'm human. But at the same time, like, I don't... I don't lose the scope that I can't actually be connected to everyone at the same. I actually had this thought. And I want to ask you guys this question. If you guys could help me figure this out. In my last podcast, um, somebody left a comment. I can't exactly remember it verbatim, but it was like, oh, I just have friends and we chill and we just kind of enjoy the moment. Uh, but Brittany has like this structure. And I realized it's because I think a lot of my friendships or people who come into my life. It's usually a lot of emotional labor. Like, I don't know if you guys do that for your friends, but maybe it's just because of the way that I am. But I rarely have people come into my life that aren't casual. Um, that like, the reason I created the hierarchy of friendship was because lots of people wanted to be, wanted more of me and my emotional labor. And I couldn't do that. That's why I have hundreds of casual friends because friends are easy to maintain if they, if they don't need emotional labor. If they don't need... Um, like one-on-one -on -one time all the time. Like I could have a group of 20 friends if we all just got together at a bowl. I like bowling. That's why I always use it as an example. You know what I mean? But I realized like the reason I needed to create the hierarchy was because I was being like, people would be like, we're going to get closer, right? And I was like, oh, I would love to get closer in a world where I had an infinite amount of spoons. So like, I love you and I love everybody, but I can't I can't be there for everyone, which is why, again, it's so inappropriate for me when people are like, we're close. We like talked twice. And I'm like, ooh, like red flag, because in my life, like I talked to everyone twice. Are you saying I'm close to everybody? I've had more conversations intimately. I've had strangers I've never known on the street cry in my arms. I have had people when I worked at a veterinary office like cry in my arms. I've had people when I worked as a nanny cry in my arms. I've had people at Walmart cry in my arms. I don't know what it is that makes them feel like they can talk to me, except I probably just listen. One time I was at Home Depot and this old man came up to me and he's like, hi. And I was like, hi. And he was like, I want to talk to you about my wife. And I was like, sure. And he was like, my wife's in surgery. And I was like, that's insane. And he goes, you want to see her foot? And showed me a picture of his wife's melting foot. And I was like, radical bro and I looked at him and we had this conversation for like 20 minutes I don't even know this man and he literally came up to me and he was like I want to tell you about my wife's surgery and I was like yeah that sounds like a normal day for Brittany sure and my brother has the same like 
blessing slash problem. We're like, people just want to talk to us. I don't know what we're doing. I don't know what we're doing with our faces. I don't know what's happening. But no matter where we are, people notice us and they want to talk to us. Right? I don't know what it is. It's like, I don't know what it is, right? Maybe it's just like how loud we are or something. I don't know. But then people tell us about their stories and all of a sudden I know everyone's intimate details. And I think it's just because I create a space for them to do it. But again, I love my friends. But I am asked, like, I think I think that was the difference maybe because I wondered, I got that comment and I was like, yeah, I think that's interesting, like, to to realize like, oh, when people have friends, they're so, no offense, casual or superficial with them, they don't need to have boundaries with friends. And then I'm living in a world where people, people are always telling me, I don't have friends and I'm thinking it's so easy to have a friend just like hang out with them once like what what you know but if you need emotional labor you know what I mean like it's crazy that is interesting I also wonder why they do that to you I'm I wish I could know I'm dying my brother and I like I don't know what it is like uh one time I went to go visit one of my siblings at their work and they were like oh my gosh what are you doing and I was like what and they're like you're so loud. You're like, your glasses are outrageous. Your, your jumpsuit standing out. Like you're just like, everyone's looking at you. And I was like, oh, I'm, I look cute. I, I look like a normal person. But there's something about me and my other brother. Everywhere we go, people are like, I want to talk to you. And I was like, oh. I don't know what it is. Like, I don't know what it is. Like when him and I, and that's why we're, we're the same farm brother, farm brother. When he, it doesn't matter what church he joins. It doesn't matter what school he goes to. It doesn't matter what world he's in. People are like, hey, what's up? And I'm like, he's like, what's up? Like he was the kid in school that knew every single table. He never had a group of friends. He had, he knew every table, right? I don't know what it is. And I'm like, what's up? And I think I, a part of it is just like, I, I don't know. I think a part of it is probably just that we're open and like we judge, but we judge in a way that people usually like. Most people that I've interacted with might hate my judgment in the moment, but they kind of like it later. Or like people go to him because they want to be judged in a fun way. But also he's like, yeah, I don't think you did that right. I think you fucked up. And they're like, whoa, why? And he'll explain it. And I'm like, no, it's like this. So maybe it's that. I don't know what it is, right? How uncomfortable that is for you to actually ask someone you barely know for that. I think it, there's something safe about it. Like, I think there's something about mine and my brother's energy. People feel safe. At least that's what they've told us. And then they feel like they can tell us something and we will be like, oh, okay, yeah. Uh-huh. It's true. You can tell my farm brother anything and he'll be like, oh, okay. Like anything. And he'll be like, mm-hmm. Yeah. He'll be like, oh, that's crazy. But he won't like freak out on you. He won't shut you out. He'll just be like, oh, yeah. And that's how I am. I'm like, mm, yeah. Which is why, again, when I meet people who are like, you know, people who want to like unalive themselves, I was like, you don't? Yeah. Half the people in my phone book want to unalive themselves. What do you mean? I, again, I don't know what it is. Part of it might be how confident you seem and people like confidence, I suppose. Yeah. People are like that with me. Why do you think they're like that with you? Discord says you feel complete and solid, Brittany. I don't feel You've got any part of you that will be melded into the rest of the painting of existence. You're too defined in yourself is my perspective. Maybe. I mean, I love that. Girl, it's the confidence. Yeah, is that it? I guess so, right? That makes sense. I love that. Like, I I wish I could be more. I wish there could be more of me to like, you know, but I have to create boundaries because again, like, it's a lot, you know? But yeah, maybe. You don't have any anxiety or present anxious. Mm. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm going to start paying attention to when I am anxious, if I get the same amount of attention. Probably not, right? Because when I'm anxious, I usually cover up and I don't make eye contact. Like if I'm feeling anxious and I have to go to the store, I wear sunglasses and a hoodie and I don't make eye contact with anyone. But if I'm feeling good and confident and warm, that's when people talk to me. Mm, yeah. Yeah, maybe it's that actually. And people seek that secure type of thing to lean on. Confidence is nothing without structure. Maybe it's that. I'll start paying attention to like, what are the days I don't feel that way? Yeah, like even in Croatia, I've already been like at the store, like old ladies will come up to me and ask me something. And I'm like, I don't speak English. And they're like, oh, but like, I can't figure out why they're asking me stuff. I wish I knew what they were asking me. You know what I mean? I wish I, I can't. I'm usually there alone when this happens. 
Not sure it's confidence, maybe just a sense of being. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Anyways, I was pondering that as well. Like, why do I need those boundaries? And a big part of it is, yeah, I was running out of spoons. I was running out of energy. I was like taking everyone's phone calls and being there for everyone I could. And then I ran out of, I ran out of juice. Yeah, that's really why I did it. You know, I grew up in a big family, was extremely involved in a community as a kid. Do you think that, ah, uh, I, I, me too. I wonder if that's it. That's us too, right? And we were involved. Like my brother and I were both involved versus like my other siblings. They were less involved, but they were there. But him and I were like leaders in the community or like we stood out in the community, you know? Yeah, I don't know. Nero says, I'm really jealous of that since I am so anxious. It is so cool that you had the confidence and little anxiety even when you were in your bad days. Well, I think one is that when I'm really, really anxious or I can't even socialize or figure out like social cues, I would argue that I'm like, uh, I'm in a place where like I'm, I'm not probably... I probably don't get that attention, right? I'm going to assume I don't. I don't know. I've never thought about it, but I'm assuming I don't get that attention. Uh, but I'm also very like, I send out the wrong signal. To be fair, when I am very warm and confident, I make direct eye contact with people. I smile at people. I wave at them. So it kind of makes sense that they would come talk to me, I think, in a way. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I would have to start paying attention. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. I've been really thinking about it. That's interesting. But to be fair, I've always been like a very confident child. Um, and unless my anxiety is like literally like or I'm having a panic attack or something, I do pretty well generally. Um, but yeah, anyways, I just thought that was interesting. And I was trying to like figure it out because the comments stood out to me. Um, yeah. Bedtime schedule. Okay. I got to go. You're right. Okay. It's 1237 AM. That means I have to get to bed and settle down and brush my teeth and floss and hope my brain shuts off in two hours, which it probably won't. Um, okay. With that said, thank you for watching. I'm glad we watched this part of the conversation with Sid Guru. Again, I've linked it in the chats. If you guys want to watch it on your own, I don't know if I'll get to the rest of it on Monday. Maybe I'll finish it on my own. Who knows? Monday, Brittany will have to make that decision. Something in the world might happen. We might cover that instead. So just in case we don't get to it, you might want to finish it on your own. In my head, in Miller bonded, my belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine, not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed, so why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking, yeah. Sick of reaching out for the truth and living life as a fool. Da, 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 da.